Hello everyone. Good day. Uh, my name is Enoch Akinabi, the Law of Thought tutor for Quigam. And today we'll be taking the topic vicarious liability. Vicarious liability. Now our expectations for this specific course is to learn the requirements that are needed to prove said thoughts. Like I initially said in our earlier modules, for each thought, there are some essential requirements that need to be proven for that thought to be ex to be established that it has been committed. So yeah, so this is what you will deal with vicarious liability, and it's a very very extensive topic, which is why it will be broken into two parts. And yeah, this is going to be a wonderful journey. So let's get started. Firstly, what you need to realize about vicarious liability is that it is not a thought in itself, rather it is a rule of responsibility through which an individual is able to find the defendant liable for the thoughts committed by another. It refers basically to a situation where party A is liable to party B for damage caused to party B by the negligence or a thought of party C. Now, why does this arise? It usually arises in master-servant or employer-employee relationships where one party is in charge of the other and that other party has caused harm to another person and the other person cannot really exact remedy the remedy he would get from charging the person that actually caused the thought to him or actually caused the damage to him the remedy he would get from such a person would not be so substantial so he looks for who can he get a greater remedy from so according to Glanville Williams vicarious liability owes its explanation to the search of a solvent defendant looking for a defendant that is able to bear the burden, shoulder the burden of defecation because it would be much much easier and much better to sue a wealthy employee employer I'm sorry a wealthy employer or master rather than the employee or servant who really has nothing much to offer in the way of damages so yeah to establish vicarious liability as a thought, three things are essential. The one, the employee committed a thought. Two, the existence of an employer-employee relationship. And three, that the employee acted in the course of his employment when committing the thought. Now we'll be taking these three elements separately and each of these elements need to be proven every time in order to establish that an employer is vicariously liable for the thought committed by the employee. Now, for the first one, commission of a thought by the employer. Remember, we said that vicarious liability in itself is not a thought. It is a rule of responsibility. So, for the first requirement, there must have been a thought. Firstly, vicarious liability of the employer only arises on the primary liability of the employee. As was seen in James and Mid Mottles, the employee himself must have committed a thought. The employee must have caused some damage as a result of his negligence or some other thought for vicarious liability for vicarious liability of the employer or the master to arise the servant of said master or, or the employee of said employer must have committed a thought if the employee did not commit a thought then can't really say that the vicarious liability of the employer has arisen because like we said vicarious liability in itself not a thought. It is just a rule of responsibility. So you cannot hold someone responsible for something that does not exist. So first, the employee slash servant must have committed a thought. And as was seen in the case of Cassidy and Minister of Health, uh, that case involved hospital liability where there are several servants or where there are several employees responsible for an operation and it is hard to prove specifically who was negligent and it was held there that the hospital would be vicariously liable unless the hospital is able to prove absence of negligence and it's also generally usually assumed that this also applies to other master servant relationship other employee employer relationships that in the case of where there are many employees working on a particular thing and it is hard to pinpoint which one of them exactly has been negligent, then the employer will be vicariously liable unless the employer is able to prove that there was no negligence. Now, on to the second key requirement, 
This is more extensive than the first requirement because there are a lot of things that go into it. The existence of an employer and employee relationship. The existence of an employer employee relationship. Remember once more, Bacal's liability is a rule of responsibility. It's not a thought in itself. It's just a, a means of holding the employer vicariously liable for the actions of the employee. So it would be unfair and illogical to hold an employer liable for the acts of someone who is not even in his employment. So that is the second key requirement, the existence of an employer and employee relationship. Now, there's a distinction here between a contract of service, also called employment, and a contract for services, where a person is employed as an independent contractor. Let me take that again. There's a distinction between a contract of service which is when you employ someone and a contract for services where a person is employed as an independent contractor. There are two different things. And it is usually a sense, and this is and this distinction is important because generally an employer is not vicariously liable for the thought of an independent contractor. It's only vicariously liable for the thought of an employee, as seen in Eco and John Holt. Remember. In law, there are general rules and there are exceptions, and there are usually exceptions to those exceptions. So there's an exception to this, but we'll get there later down the line. But keep in mind that generally, an employer is not vicariously liable for the thought of an independent contractor, only that of an employee. That is why it is important to determine whether a master-servant relationship exists or whether an employer-employee relationship exists, whether the contract between them is one of services slash employment or if it is merely one for services, making the person an independent contractor. Now, there are a number of factors that courts usually use to determine the existence of an employer-employee relationship. And I'll be running through a number of them because the courts believe that a lot of things depend on the fact of the case. So instead of just making one rigid rule, they highlight a number of factors that will swing the pendulum in one direction or the other, depending on the circumstances of a particular case. The first of which is the terms of the contract. Now, generally, courts have held that we examine the substance of the contract, not just its technical words or the mere wordings alone. It is possible that in a contract between an employer and an employee, that it is written there, oh, I'm employing you as an independent contractor, blah, 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 blah. But essentially, when it comes to it, the court will realize that the, the terms of the contract, the responsibilities on both ends, shows that it is a contract of employment, not a contract for an independent contractor. So the court will not just examine the mere wording, they will examine the substance of the contract. As seen in Ferguson and Dawson, where it was held that where it was held that the relationship there was one of an employer-employee, even though the contract stated expressly that it was self-employed labor involving only a subcontractor. So yeah, that's the first thing that courts look at, the terms of the contract. And it's not just mere words. Remember, they will examine the substance of the contract, looking deeply into the obligations of each party to determine whether it is an independent contractor contract or it's an employee-employee relationship. Now, the second is control. An employee slash servant is considered to do the work on his employer's terms. Meaning that the employee isn't just told what to do, he is also told how to do it. He's also under authority, like uh, someone else has oversight, the employer has oversight over him. Whereas an independent contractor is more or less his own master. The latter is just bound to fulfill the terms of the contract that this is what you have been contracted to do. There's not really specificity as to how said thing gets done because they rely on the independent contractor's own judgment and skills. This is why generally an employer is not held liable for the thought of an independent contractor because it is assumed that he is not in control of an independent contractor's activities. So yeah, as seen in Collins and Atford share, Hilberry J noted that in a contract of service slash employment, the employer can dictate not only what is to be done, but how it should be done. While in a contract for service slash an independent contractor contract, the employer can only detect what is to be done. Yeah, that's a very important distinction to keep in mind. However, as a result of our modern, how will I put it, our modern realities these days, I'm pretty sure you'll notice that there are a lot of 
professional employees that exercise a lot of discretion in carrying out their duties, especially where they are much more experienced and they've been doing it for a long time. So like this category, this, uh, this element, this factor of control cannot just be the only, cannot just be the only determining factor as to whether the contract is that of his master servant slash employer, employee, or it is one of an independent contractor. Because as you can see, in modern times, a lot of employees, doctors, pilots, lawyers, and co, they, as a result of the specialized skills required, specialized skills and knowledge required for the profession they function in, they act a little bit like independent contractors, while in the real sense of it, they are employees. So control cannot be the sole determining factor. That takes us to our next uh our next factor that the court can consider in determining whether there is the existence of an employer and employee relationship. That is the organizational test, organizational test. Now, this involves looking at the, this involves looking at the employees, the scope of the employee's work in relation to the organization is working for. Then in LJ, in Steven C. Jordan and Harrison Limited and McDonald and Evan Limited, noted that under a contract for services, that's an independent contractor contract, that although the work is done for the business, it is not integrated into the organization. The person is not working, is not working in the organization. Even though the work is done for the business, the individual is only an accessory to it. It's like employing someone to, to build a house for you. In that manner of speaking, although you are the employer and the person is building a house for you maybe for a business or something that is not part of what you do that is not part of what your business does although the work is being done for you for your business while under a contract of service a employee employee is part of the business under a contract of service the employee is part of the business his work is an integral part of the business his work cannot be dissociated from the business. So yeah, that's the third element that courts can look at. The fourth is the multiple tests. The fourth element is, is like a catch-all condition. After they've looked at the terms of the contract, they've looked at the control, they've looked at the organizational test, and it's still not clear, then the court will consider the relationship as a whole slash multiple test. That's the relationship as a whole slash multiple test. So this has been used in a number of cases, a lot of them. Like already mixed concrete limited and minister of pensions and national insurance, Stevenson and Dell, Bay Diesel System Limited, Market Investigation, Minister of Social Security, Shinal Security and Afro Park Nigeria Limited. There are a lot of cases like this, not just these ones. And usually in these cases, these cases dealt with a number of facts that are not they are not they are not exactly similar per se because each case has its own unique unique facts has its own unique circumstances. So the court will take into consideration a number of extraneous factors to determine whether there is an employer-employee relationship, such as whether, whether there are mutual obligations on both parties. Are both parties meant to, meant to uh, perform obligations that are equal? Or does one party have greater control over the activities of another party? Is one party's performance predicated on the performance of the other party? Things like that. Uh, whether the worker can profit from his or her performance. If a worker can profit from his or her performance, usually that gives you the element of an independent contractor kind of deal. But if the contract is just, if the worker is just entitled to a salary, to a salary and maybe little little bonuses and code that gives you the feel of an employer employee relationship uh, the third one is whether there's a fit time and place of performance it is a greater like there's a greater likelihood of it being deemed an employer employee relationship where there's a physical location or maybe even a virtual one that that there is a fixed that is a fixed place or time of performance Usually, uh, you have to realize that these uh, principles have been made over a long period of time and we have to interpret them, we have to interpret 
them in light of current realities. That's why I, I mentioned um, virtual performance at all because very, it's a very common thing now to see people working in remote jobs, but yet they are employees. It's also possible to see people working remote jobs and they are independent contractors. This is why uh, it takes a lot of finagling to determine which is which. Another factor that can be considered is the payment of wages. Payment of wages. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier as well. That is the employee entitled to a fixed salary or a wage? Or is the person entitled to only a lump sum at the end of the job or things like that? And another is the degree of financial risk undertaken by the worker. Usually in an employer-employee relationship is the one that that takes on the risk of doing business. But when it comes to an independent contractor kind of relationship, as we can see even from the old principle of vicarious liability, the independent contractor will bear the risks of doing his own business. Even though he is doing the work for you, he will be liable for anything he does. So you can, you can see that it's even related to the entire principle of vicarious liability as a whole. The degree of financial risk undertaken by the worker. Yeah. And there's also this category because you know that human relationship Human relationships are very, very transient in nature. They are very, very flexible things. Flexible things. They, they change a lot. Same thing with business relationships, commercial relationships. There's no fixed standard. So there are some certain situations that arise where uh, a general employer lends out an employee to another employer. And maybe that employee that was lent out commits a tort while working for the second employer. So what happens? Who is vicariously liable for the tort? Is it the general employer that lent, lent him out in the first place? Or the second employer who he is currently working for? Lending a servant. Yeah, that's... So where is the general employer of B agrees to hire out B to C? And in the course of his temporary service to C, B commits a tort. A, the general employer will be held liable. That's general rule. Remember, law as a... Law as a course, law as a study... Usually general rules followed by exceptions, followed by exceptions to the exceptions, and in some frustrating situations, the exceptions to those exceptions. Yeah, like that. So the general rule is that the general employer will be held liable unless he can prove that at the time the tort was committed, he had divested himself of all control over the seven. Means that Unless the general employer can prove that he was not in control of the employee's activities anymore, he was not in control of the manner of what the employee was doing and the manner in which he did it, that the general employer will be held liable unless he can prove that. Now, in the case of Mercy Docks and Harbour Board and Coggins and Griffith Limited, this is a locus classicus case for this principle. I would just like to know that the cases I have set out in this in these slides are the major ones for this topic although there are other cases there are a number of other cases you can also consult you can also read up on the judgments for greater understanding this is just like uh, a brief a brief overview to give you guidance on how to go about it and point you in the right direction so yeah and if you want even greater direction it is best to also consult copious textbooks like Wanfield and Jolowitz on thoughts read that if you have more than enough or SMA let me on thoughts or Codilie. yeah so Mercy Doc and the Harbour Board and Coggin and Griffith Limited here the appellant employed B as a crane driver they hired him out with the crane to the respondent and while loading a ship B negligently injured someone and it was held that the appellant were vicariously liable as it wasn't sufficient alone to show that the respondent controlled the task to be done. Remember, if the general employer is to prove that he wasn't liable, he has to show that he has divested himself of all control over the servant. In that particular case, it was it was seen from the fact and from the circumstances that oh, that the general employer hired out not only the servant, not only the employee, but also the ma the machinery through which the employee was doing the work. And it was also the one that probably trained said employee as well. So it was held that the general employer was vicariously liable. 
because it is much, much easier to infer that a general employer is liable when an employee is sent to perform a task with a device, with a mechanical device that the general employer owns. Because you won't want to lend out your means of doing business, you want to lend out your property with a worker and then say that you had no oversight at all over what the worker was doing. This very act showed that the latter, that the general employer was still in control of the method of performance, not even if he wasn't in control of the task being performed. Another case that is quite similar to that, that espoused this principle in Nigeria is Rotimi and Adegunle. Rotimi and Adegunle. In that case, the appellant hired a lorry with a driver from the respondent to convey logs, to convey um, three logs from Ubadan to Abel Kuta. And due to the driver's negligence, there was a collision which injured the appellant. And the court found that the respondents were vicariously liable as they were the ones the, the driver was working for with the lorry. The driver, the lorry belonged to the respondents. So there was a general presumption that we have established when it comes to where an employee is sent to perform a task with a mechanical device that the general employer owns, that the general employer still controls the method of the method of performance. That's easier to infer. Unless the unless the specific employer, the second employer is able to dispute it very well, which in this case they were not able to. It is also more likely for the general employer to be held vicariously liable if the machinery loan that is complex with a skilled worker. Remember what I said about um, them being in charge, the general employer being in charge of the training to use the me mechanical device. Because if it is something complex, if the mechanical device or machinery is something complex that requires a skilled worker, it's easier to prove that, oh, the general employer is the one that trained him, the general employer is the one that equipped him. Therefore, the general employer should be the one liable, not the second employer who just hired him to do a particular job for a particular for a set period of time. Why if the employee lent out is just to be used as unskilled labor, it's just to be used as unskilled labor, then the temporary hirer will instead be held vicariously liable. Also as seen in the case of Mercy Dogs and Holly versus Lumina Leisure. It would be best to read up on these cases for a better understanding because they are not as straightforward as I'm setting them out here. I'm doing this because of time constraints uh, and, and also to facilitate understanding. But a greater level of understanding comes when you go through them yourself with your own eyes, get a whole new appreciation for these principles. Now, on to our third requirement. You can see that uh, the requirements have been growing in degree of difficulty or uh, let's say difficulty more like technicality yeah in degree of technicality you know first we started with the commission of a thought by the employee servant then we moved on to the existence of an employer and employee relationship and now we are at the existence no sorry we are at, uh, the employee acted in the course of the employment now this is a lot trickier one of the trickier requirements because you have to prove that not only did the employee commit a tort, not only was the employee employed by the employer in such a capacity, but that the tort that was committed was committed in the course of employment because it would be illogical and it would be illogical and contrary to contrary to the general tenets of fair play and law to hold an employer vicariously liable for all the acts of someone he employs just because the person is his employee. So the employee must have committed the tort or acted in the course of employment when the tort was committed. Now, a local class cost case for this is via systems in bracket Tyneside Limited versus Thermal Transfer Limited, where it was held that both employers exercise some control. Oh, oh, uh, this case, this case is for our previous principle. This case is for our previous principle about lending a servant. Yeah, this case is for our previous principle about lending a servant. Generally, this case is just there to emphasize that it is quite possible that both employers can be liable, both the general employer and the 
temporary hire, if it can be if it can be established that both employers exercise some measure of control over the employee, then both might be jointly liable. Then it would be possible for the it would be possible for the tort visa to sue both the general employer and the specific hire in that situation. Now, for the third requirement, the employee must have acted in the course of employment. Generally, an employee is seen to be acting in the course of his employment if his conduct is authorized by the employer or is considered to be an unauthorized manner of doing his job. Let me take that again. Generally, an employee is seen to be acting in the course of his employment if his conduct is authorized by the employer or it is considered to be an unauthorized manner of performing his job. So this goes to show that the, the liability of the vicarious liability of an employer arises not only from when the employee is acting in the course of his employment, but also if the employee is doing what he has been employed to do in an unauthorized manner. This kind of widens the liability, widens the liability a little bit. And as we go on, you'll see what I mean. Now, the scope of employment is determined by the facts of each case. As I said before, all facts, different circumstances. So these are the following factors that are usually considered. First is the manner of doing the work the servant was employed to do. The manner of doing the work the servant was employed to do. The manner of doing the work the servant was employed to do. Remember that the employer can be held liable not just when the employee is acting in the course of his employment, but when he's acting in an unauthorized manner of performing his job. So, we look at the manner of doing the work the servant was employed to do to determine the scope of his employment. Ergo, the scope of the employer's liability in relation to whether the employee was acting in the course of his employment. As seen in the case of Century Insurance and NI Road Transport Board, in that case, a petrol tanker driver was held to have acted in the course of his employment when he discarded a lighted match while delivering petrol at the petrol station, which caused an explosion. From what we said before, as you can see clearly here, discarding a lighted match while you are de delivering petrol is a very, very bad idea. And it is definitely an unauthorized manner of doing his job as a petrol tanker driver. But it cannot be said that he was not performing his job in that situation because it was while he was in the course of his employment that was when he discarded said lighted match, which was the closure. So it was still in the course of his employment, even though it was an unauthorized manner of performing his job. And in that case, held that, yes, the employer Second, the authorized limits of time and place. The authorized limits of time and place. Take note of these factors because these factors are a little bit tricky, especially the second one. It relates to authorized limits of time and place. When you go through the textbooks, you will see it, you will see a lot about um the employee acting in the course of his employment, the employee going on a frolic of his own. And things like that, things that might not be the chance to substantive on properly as a result of the, the time constraints on each module. Now, this second authorized limit of time and place. A deviation generally from a journey taken in the course of employment will take the employee out of the course of employment unless this deviation was incidental. What this means is that if an employee is sent on a journey to perform an obligation for the employer and he decides to while doing the job and he decides that while doing the job he decides to take a break maybe to tend to his natural needs maybe to eat drink or to relieve himself in a manner of speaking that's still incidental to the employment but if he decides to do something entirely out of the scope of employment, if he decides to do something entirely out of the scope of employment, then cannot be said in that situation that the employee was acting in the course of his employment. Now, this particular factor is a bit tricky. That is why it is important to look at the facts of the cases and what the judges have said, especially in the cases of Hartman and Pearson, Astoria and Ashton. Because there's just there's only a slight distinction between a deviation from a journey taken in the course of employment and a deviation that is incidental to that employment. When the deviation is incidental to the employment, 
is incidental to the job he has been asked to do, then he is still in the course of his employment. But where the deviation is not incidental to the employment, he would have gone outside of the scope of his employment, he will no longer be in the course of the employment and the employer cannot be held vicariously liable in that situation. Now the third requirement is express prohibition. The third is express prohibition. Express prohibition. That even if the employer expressly prohibits a conduct, this does not mean that the employee acts outside the scope of employment. Now, you have to realize that there is a distinction between doing something, doing performing your job in an unauthorized manner, which in which you will still be in the course of employment and acting outside the scope of employment. Now, if the employer, in order to escape is vicarious liability expressly prohibits a conduct. This does not prevent him from being vicariously liable. This does not mean that the employee has acted outside the scope of employment. Where the prohibition limits the scope of employment, there is no vicarious liability. Where the prohibition limits the scope of employment, there is no vicarious liability. What I was trying to explain is that there's a difference between scope of employment and conduct in the course of employment. If the employer just limits your conduct, the employee's conduct in the course of his employment, and he still performs his job in an other unauthorized manner, he does a conduct that was expressly prohibited while in the course of employment, the employer will still be vicariously held liable. But where the employer limit the scope of employment itself. He isn't just limiting uh, conduct in the course of employment. Where he limits the scope of, scope of employment, then it cannot be said in that situation that the employ employer is vicariously liable. A number of cases that have been decided on, on that principle, Limpus and London General Omnibus Co and Rose and Plenty. This, let me give you, let me give you a practical example of this situation here. For example, where you employ someone to be a driver, and the driver alone. The driver cannot decide to, let us say, enter the office one day and start auditing accounts and then makes an error and stuff like that and then the client sues you. In that kind of situation, what he was employed for was to be a driver. It is outside the scope of his employment. Now, if you employ a driver to be a driver for you, to be a driver to, uh, to, to maybe make, to drive people, passengers in a bus, and then he's told not to do some particular things while driving, maybe not to drink and drive. And then while driving, one day he decides to take some alcohol. In that kind of situation, the employer will still be vicariously liable because the limitation was as to conduct in the course of the employment. And the conduct he did did not take him outside of the scope of his employment. I hope that that's, that's explanatory. To be best to conduct, consult these cases, Rose and Plenty, Limpus and General and London General Omnibus Co for a better understanding. Now, the fourth factor that the courts can consider is determine whether the employee acted in the course of his employment is connection, is the connection with the employer's business. The connection with the employer's business. If the employee does an act which he has no express authority to do, the employer has not authorized him to do it, but it is for the employer's interest then the employer will be held vicariously liable because it is for his benefit. Unless, this is the exception here, unless the employer's act is extreme, unless the employer's act is extreme, it is something so out, so far out there that even if, you, even if the employee was doing it for the employer's interest and he had no express authority to do it and the action is extreme, the, yeah, the employer cannot be held vicariously liable for that because in the first place, he didn't have express authority to do it, even though he was doing it for the employer's interest. And further, the employee's act was so extreme to take it outside or was acceptable. In Poland and Par, Poland and Par, the employees acted in protection of the employer's business by striking a person accused of accused of stealing a bag of sugar. And it was held that the employer was vicariously liable. In this situation, they had no express authority to strike someone, but they were acting to protect the employer's business and the action was deemed by the courts not to be too extreme. So it was held that the employer was vicariously liable for their actions, even though he didn't expressly authorize them to do it. The fifth factor courts might consider in determining uh, whether the employee is acting in the course of his employment is improper delegation. Improper delegation. 
Now, if the employee in question further delegates his duty to unqualified persons without the employer's consent, then the employer would not be vicariously liable. Because that's quite illogical and it's against the principle of delegators non protest delegare. That if the employer in question further delegates is similar to that principle, further delegates his duty to unqualified persons without the employer's consent, then the employer will not be vicariously liable. Because first of all, the employer did not employ the person that the authority was delegated to. Neither did he neither did he consent to the delegation of duties from delegation of duties by his employee to someone else. That was seen in the case of Daudu and Adbonaho. Daudu and Adbonaho here a truck driver was carrying empty bottles. He arrived, saw a long queue, decided to ask a part a third party to take care of goods in the lorry. He asked that third party not to drive the lorry, just to just observe it, keep an eye on it. He also took away the keys. The driver took away the keys. However, the third party found a way to drive the truck and caused damage. It was held that the employers of the driver couldn't be held vicariously liable for such a case because, first of all, the driver had no authority to delegate his duties to another person. And secondly, it's clear from the fact and the scenario here that the driver expressly told the third party he didn't even delegate the authority to drive the truck to the third party. But yet the third party found a way to do it. It would be unconscionable to have held the employer vicariously liable for the actions of a third party whom he has no relationship with. Uh, yeah, there's also a category of where a crime is committed by an employee. Remember that it's quite possible for an action to be a crime and a thought at the same time to be a thought and a crime. And as seen in Lloyd and Grace Smith, Lister and Esley Hall, it is possible for an employer to be vicariously liable for a thought, which is also a crime. It will be liable, vicariously liable for the thought. However, if the crime committed is something the employee has no authority to deal with, if the crime committed by the employee is something that is not connected to his scope of employment, is not in any way something authorized by the employer, and it is something the employee has no authority to deal with, then the employer won't be vicariously liable because basically it's outside of the scope of authority. So lastly, we come to exceptions. Remember, I mentioned this earlier that we have exceptions to the general rule of that an independent contractor, that an employer will not be liable, vicariously liable for the torts committed by an independent contractor. Now, these are the exceptions to that general rule. An employer of an independent contractor may be liable for the actions of said independent contractor if, one, he authorizes the thought. He authorizes the thought. Where the employer authorizes the independent contractor to commit the thought, then there's no annual. The employer will be liable for the thought as well as the independent contractor. As seen in Ellis and Sheffield, Sheffield Gas Consumer Company, A employed an independent contractor to dig a trench and the passerby fell into it and was injured. And it was held by the court that both the independent contractor, both the employer, all joined, were liable for public nuisance. Yeah, because he authorized it. The second is if it involves a strict liability tort. If it involves a strict liability tort, that brings to mind that that's also one of the modules we'll be considering later on, strict liability tort. Uh, this, there are basically two torts under this category, the rule in Rylands and Fletcher and liability for animals. It's in a, it's in a, it's a, it's in a later module as we continue with the semester. So like, we'll get there, just, just stick with us. Uh, so yeah, if it involves a strict liability tort, strict liability tort are tort that as long as the fact, as long as the requirements of the tort are present, it does not matter intentionality or unintentionality does not matter, you'll be liable for the tort. If the independent contractor commits a strict liability tort in the course of doing the employer's work, e.g. trespass, nuisance, rural riders and Fletcher, then the employer in some situations, like in those thoughts and some of those thoughts I just mentioned, in some situations, may be liable for the independent contractor's actions. It may be liable for the independent contractor's actions. Remember, it's not in all cases, just some. Itambong, as in Itambong and Akonye. Now, we have gone through the requirements to prove vicarious liability. We've gone through the requirements needed to prove vicarious liability that the employer employee has committed a tort, the existence of an employer-employee relationship, the employee uh, the employee has acted in the course of his employment while committing the tort. We have also gone through the subcategories under each of these requirements, while also pointing out some some important cases, some important authorities and principles 
So this brings us to the end of vicarious liability. See you in the next module. It's been nice having you. Uh, it's been nice having me in your ear. That sounds really weird. But it's been nice having you here. Yeah. Thanks. Join us in the next Law of Thoughts module. I still remain Enoch, your Law of Thoughts tutor. Thank you. See you around.